Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. So for those of you who joined us for the historical case study oh, some, some months ago that looked at the tentative manual for the defense of advanced bases, today brings us something in the same line, except this time in execution. Mr. Timothy Skip Crawley will take us through the defense of Wake Island. Skip Crowley is a former infantry officer who lived expeditionary force and readiness. On 31 July 1990, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines was finishing up the summer package of Bridgeport in California. 15 days later, 17 was getting off airplanes in Saudi Arabia. Skip was the platoon commander of Weapons Company, excuse me, Weapons Platoon Alpha Company 17, and Desert Shield Desert Storm was the highlight of his career. Skip has done a great deal of military history study since uh, his early days and has had several book reviews published in the Marine Corps Gazette. So Skip, welcome to the broadcast, and I will turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Ian. Okay, so for uh, this afternoon, uh, the main way I'm going to frame this uh, podcast about Wake Island is to frame it in the, in the sense that uh, the first couple weeks of a, of a war, when it starts, is going to be very, very confused. Uh, and and uh, as we go through here, you'll see that even though the Marines on Wake Island were expecting an attack, the uh, the shock of it and the newness of it as uh, people had not been in combat was still a pretty uh, pretty uh, uh, strong pill to swallow. So the most the most interesting thing I find about the Battle of Wake Island when I was a kid reading military history was that of all the amphibious assaults in World War II, the only one that was beaten back at the sea, pushed back into the sea, was the first Japanese attack on Wake Island. And I thought that was appropriate because Marines, as the uh, authors uh, of amphibious warfare, as a practitioners of amphibious warfare, were the, I thought it was uh, very, uh, um, uh, obvious or whatever that they as the practitioners of amphibious warfare would be the only people to be back in an in, in amphibious assault at, at sea or push it back into the sea. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to talk about towards the end is did the, did the Navy abandon the Marine Corps at Wake Island? Then I'm going to flow into did the Navy abandon the Marines at Guadalcanal because it was the same admiral in both situations. Okay, uh, Wake Island was discovered in uh, 1568 by a Spanish explorer. Um, he took a look at the uh, the currents and the reefs and uh, dismissed it as useless. He didn't even go ashore. Uh, then in 1796, a uh, British merchant ship uh, stopped by the island. Uh, and like the Spanish explorer, uh, the, the ship's captain, Samuel Wake, did not go ashore. He thought it was pretty useless also, but he named it after himself. Uh, and so that's how Wake Island got its name. And if you take a look at the picture there, you'll see that Wake Island is actually made up of three smaller islands around a lagoon. So Wake Island itself is the, uh, the largest one in the east. And then you have Peel Island to the northwest and then Wilkes Island kind of to the west. And as we get into the battle, the second attempt to take Wake Island, Wilkes Island actually plays a big role, big role in that. Now, Wake Island had no real value to anybody until about the mid thirties when Pam Ann or Pan Am uh, started their uh, famous Clipper Pacific Clipper service. So they took those large flying boats, as you can see in the picture on the bottom right hand corner of the slide. And they flew them from uh, San Francisco and San Pedro, which San Pedro is in the LA area. They flew them from the West Coast 
to Honolulu, to Midway, to Wake, to Guam, and then on to the Philippines. And uh, these were ref refueling stops for uh, the uh, Pan Am Clipper. But as war with Japan approached, um, our Navy took a look at the defenses in the Pacific, and they felt that um, Wake Island was a sentry for the Hawaiian Islands, which consists of Hawaii uh, up to the Midway Island, up to Midway Island. So they really saw it as a kind of an early warning, an early warning uh, post. And uh, they considered it after they did the Hepburn report in 1938, they considered the third most important uh, point in our uh, naval defenses, Pearl Harbor being number one, Midway being number two, Wake Island being number three. Now this is essentially, this is the same slide, but this is a uh, war plan orange. And uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. War Plan Orange is the Navy's was the Navy's construct for fighting a war in the Pacific. They worked on this basically from 1920 to 1940. Um, all of their uh, uh, war gaming at Newport at the Naval War College revolved around this. Their tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, that they developed, such as underway refueling, revolved around this. What the plan was, in essence, was that the U.S. fleet would gather on the West Coast, sortie to Pearl Harbor, um, conduct maintenance, get ready to advance, and then advance across the Central Pacific, more or less according to that orange arrow, taking islands in the Marshalls, in the Carolinas, in the Marianas, for uh, airfields and ports, just to let you know that uh, for most of the 20s and 30s, it was really, the Navy was really looking at seizing undefended or lightly defended uh, ports or, or islands. It wasn't really until the Marine Corps adopted the, adopted the amphibious doctrine, the tentative manual for landing operation in 1934, did the Navy start taking a look at really seizing, seizing um, islands that would be heavily defended. But the point is, is that the Navy would advance across the Western Pacific, the Marine Corps would seize an island or island chain, the Navy would use that for advanced base, then they'd go west again, seize another island, et cetera, et cetera. The plan was that you'd uh, get to the Philippines and relieve the uh, Philippines of a Japanese blockade, and then you would fight the uh, Japanese uh, fleet somewhere in the Western Pacific, and presumably our Navy would win. And then uh, we conduct a blockade of Japan and they presumably would surrender. Now around 1930, the Navy decided that uh, they could not get to the Philippines fast enough to raise the blockade. So that, that went out the door and what they were doing was they'd get to the Mariana Islands and then uh, somewhere west of there, northwest of there, they fight the Japanese fleet. The thing I do want to point out here is that if you take a look at uh, the Marshall Islands, which are south of Wake Island, uh, and, and they're in the orange arrow there, the uh, the attacks uh, coming up, the attacks at Wake Island will be. Uh, the attacks on Wake Island will be coming from the Marshall Islands, so that's important to that's important to um, to keep in mind. Okay, so World War II starts on 1 September 1939 when Hitler invades Poland. Um, he conquers uh, Poland real quick, uh, and then uh, there's a Sitzkrieg, the Forney War, and then in uh, 19 uh, May 19 May 10th 1940 uh, he attacks France using the operational construct of my uh, favorite historical general, which was Eric von Manstein, uh, took down France in six weeks. And what you had was come June 1940, you had uh, France conquered. You had it uh, appear that Britain was going to about to be invaded. And I mentioned that because it's June 1940 when Congress really opened up the money spigot. 
And to give you an example of that, in June uh, 1940, Congress passed the Two Ocean Navy Act. And what that did was we had, uh, we had uh, five aircraft carriers at the time in commission. We would have seven by the time the war ends, but they authorized five more aircraft carriers in that one act. And uh, like someone in the army said, uh, before then we had all the time in the world and no money. Now we have all the money in the world in no time. So as you'll see, $20 million was appropriate to make Wake Island a combat outpost. But you'll also note that the first contractors did not arrive until early January. And uh, so the money was appropriated and then the sense of urgency kind of waned. Uh, and that was true, not just uh, with Wake Island, but with, with kind of our country as a whole. Um, in 1941, when it came time for the draft to be reinstated or to be continued, the year after it was passed in 1940, that passed Congress by one vote. So anyway, um, the contractors are there and they've arrived at Wake Island. They're, they start building the airfield, dredging the lagoon, putting up the buildings, including the uh, uh, Pan Am Hotel and Pan Am uh, facilities. And then uh, on uh, 15 October, 1941, Major James Devereaux, the XO of the 1st Marine Defense Battalion arrives on Wake to take command of its small American garrison. And you'll also note, and this is something that surprised me as I was doing the research for this, that Major Devereaux was there for less than two months before, before Wake Island was attacked. And, um, um, and he, it didn't give him a much, it didn't give him much time to prepare the island for, uh, to be defended. And the other thing is, is that when uh, Major Devereaux showed up, he uh, he told the civilian contractors to stop building the buildings and and doing the things for uh, Pan Am and those facilities and to get busy digging um, gun emplacements and such. And they said, no, we're not going to. Um, you can't give us orders unless war breaks out. He sent a message back to Pearl Harbor saying, hey, you know, war's coming. Can I not have control of these guys? And Pearl Harbor answered, no, not until actual war happens. So what you have is you have Major Devereaux's Marines working for almost two months uh, as, as fast as they can to, uh, to put the gun emplacements in and uh, all, all the other uh, fighting positions in while the contractors are over, over in another part of the island putting up buildings and such. Okay, on that 28 November, 1941, Commander uh, Scott Cunningham takes command by a 1926 law, um, which also uh, was established the Army Air Corps by 1926 law, all Navy, all aviation capable ships, aircraft carriers and seaplane tenders and Naval air stations had to be commanded by an a Naval aviator. So Wake Island is, is officially established as a Naval air station on 27 November. Now I'm actually going to more or less read this slide because I want you to see just how few Marines Major Devereaux, Devereaux had. So he had 15 officers and 373 enlisted Marines. Uh, at TO, a Marine Defense Battalion was 43 officers and 939 enlisted Marines. So he had substantially less than half of an entire defense battalion, which is what Wake, uh, Wake uh, rated. The Marine Defense Battalion uh, consisted of three groups. It was commanded by a colonel, so you could think of it as a very large battalion or a small regiment. It had a coastal defense group, uh, three batteries of two five-inch guns each. You can take a look at the picture on the right hand, uh, bottom right hand corner of the slide. Those uh, five-inch guns were taken from uh, old uh, Navy cruisers and uh, repurposed as shore defense, uh, shore defense batteries. He had an anti-aircraft artillery group of uh, three batteries of four three-inch guns each, but he only had enough Marines to man six of the 12 three-inch guns. 
and he had a machine gun group consisting of two machine gun companies of 30 caliber machine guns and two uh, anti-aircraft machine gun companies of 24 50 caliber air-cooled heavy machine guns now the uh, they the water-cooled heavy machine guns were the ones that look like they're from world war one they have a, a water jacket on it they uh, they uh, they had a, a, a large tri large heavy tripod they put them in and back back then they were almost they were looked almost like uh, uh, on upon uh, as a supporting arm, almost like a supporting arm. So then, uh, uh, and then he had 24 uh, 50 caliber uh, mod deuces, which we're all familiar with. You'll notice that uh, less than half, he was able to man less than half the uh, machine guns and uh, anti-aircraft guns. So if you take a look at what he, what he prioritized, he prioritized, um, Manning the coastal defense group. He manned all six of his five inch guns and manned about half of his anti aircraft guns and slightly less than half of his machine guns. Now, uh, Wake had no radar. Uh, supposedly, it was supposed to be put on the ship with the, uh, the initial ship with the uh, contractors and the, uh, the Marines, and it was not put on there. Uh, and then you had uh, uh, a little over 1,100 civilian contractors on wake. On 4 December, uh, VMF 211, Marine Fighter Squadron 211, arrives with uh, 12 F4F Wildcats. So on 6 December, the day before the war starts, you have basically 400 Marines, ground Marines, uh, a squadron of Hellcats, 12 Hellcats, and 1100 plus contractors on wake island okay i want to make a, a a strong point here i want to make a major point here unlike pearl harbor which was surprised as we all well know the uh, the marines on wake island on 8 december and it's eight it was 8 december west of the international day line 7 december east of the international day line on 8 december the uh, the marines at, on Wake Island, when they got the word, uh, word that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, were at general quarters. They were uh, in their fighting positions. They were manning their machine guns, their anti-aircraft guns, their coast defense guns, and uh, they were expecting a, a bombing attack by the Japanese from the Marshall Islands. However, when the first attack came, which was about noon, uh, they uh, they not only they even though they were expecting an attack being being their first combat experience a lot of the marines were still in shock afterwards there was a lot of confusion uh, after the uh, japanese planes bombed bombed wake island now uh devereaux had four of his 12 fighters up in the air on combat air patrol the other eight were on the ground Seven of them were destroyed on the ground by the Japanese bombing attack on 8 December. Now, why did that happen? Well, if you if you recall, I said a few moments ago that when uh, Major Devereaux showed up in mid-October, he could not force the contractors to build fighting positions and such. So one of the lower priorities that they had was to build the uh, for the airplanes, which would protect them, not from a direct bomb hit, but protect them from shrapnel and blast. And uh, uh, those had not been built yet, and they were being dug, they were being built on, on 8 December, and they would be done about 1,400. And they, uh, they kept the airplanes on the airfield instead of dispersing them, because they were very concerned that if they drug them around the coral of Wake Island, you damage an airplane, which actually happened. I mentioned this because you take a look at this and and uh, Major Devereaux, Major Puppy Maceo, the VMF 211, had a hard decision to make. Whether or, whether or not you disperse the planes or you hope that in the Japanese won't attack for two more hours and you put them in the protective, protective, uh, protective places. And that's going to be normal on, on any uh, on at the beginning of a war. You, 
the, the commanding officer, the people in charge are going to be faced with a lot of, a lot of decisions like this that are, um, you know, danged if you do, danged if you don't. Okay, so on 11 December, the Japanese uh, attempt to take Wake Island. They, uh, they're very confident, they're overconfident uh, that they can take the island. Uh, so they only use 450 uh, what they call Special Naval Landing Force, which are sometimes called Japanese Marines. And they have some uh, light cruisers and some destroyers for supporting it with uh, naval gunfire. So uh, what happens is, is that the Japanese land 300 of their troops on Wake Island proper and 150 on Wilkes Island. And or that's what that's what the plan was. But what Major Devereaux told his Marines to do at the coastal defense, the coastal defense guns was to hold their fire. And uh, that really bought that a lot of his Marines were getting really ticked off at him. Because the Japanese cruisers and destroyers were coming in closer and closer when they didn't receive any fire from Wake Island. They came in closer and closer, and his Marines were wondering how come he doesn't tell us to fire. Well, he told them to fire at uh, 4,500 yards, which is pretty much point blank range for one of these five inch coastal guns, whose maximum range was 14,500 yards. And it took the Japanese by surprise. They sank one destroyer uh, outright. They damaged a, uh, uh, they heavily damaged a light cruiser which is, I do to my research for this, sometimes is listed as sunk, but it wasn't actually sunk. They, some people think it was sunk because it was retiring, um, making a lot of smoke, but it wasn't actually sunk. And then uh, another destroyer was sunk by the, the Wildcats. So the landing force, you know, was never actually got onto the island. They were pretty much decimated. And with the losses of the sailors and the destroyers and the cruisers, um, the uh, the Marines on Wake Island killed between seven, uh, seven and 800 men. And as I mentioned, in World War II, this is the only amphibious assault in six years of war that was stopped at the water's edge. And I thought that was highly appropriate that it was Marines that did that. So if you take a look at the, uh, the Commandant's uh, Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations concept, where he's talking about uh, Marines sinking Chinese ships, there's there's historical precedent for that. And incidentally, these Japanese ships, the two destroyers were the first Japanese ships sunk by American forces in World War II. Okay, part of the uh, Wake Island mythos is that uh, the Marines on Wake Island sent a message saying, send us more Japs. Here's what actually happened. Um, Wake Island was communicating with, with Pearl Harbor on a daily basis. Commander Cunningham, the CO there, was communicating with Pearl Harbor on a daily basis. Uh, and the message that he sent back to Pearl Harbor, uh, saying that he had repelled the Japanese assault and sank a couple of destroyers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the radio man put some padding uh, in the padding of the message he put, send us more Japs. Now, padding for messages in World War II and naval message traffic in, in our Navy in World War II was designed to confuse anyone trying to break the code. And they were supposed to put nonsensical um, verbiage in front and behind the actual message. And they were uh, supposed to make sure that that verbiage had nothing to do with the message so that people didn't... Uh, confuse it as being part of the message. But uh, they people back in Pearl Harbor uh, got confused about this. They thought that was part of the message. It got to the newspapers and the newspapers are saying, well, look at the Marines, you know, they, they want more Japs. And in fact, as you would imagine, the last thing they wanted is more Japs, more Japanese. Um, but that's how that happened. Some of you may be aware that uh, in October 1944, something similar happened during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Uh, Admiral Nimitz sent a message to Admiral Halsey saying, where is Task Force 34? Um, repeat, where is Task Force 34? And that was the message that some incident at Pearl Harbor then put in 
uh, the world wonders. And that's what Halsey received. He thought Nimitz was was uh, ridiculing and criticizing him for um, for that, and he, he wasn't. So uh, you got to be careful with the padding. And then on uh, the day after the assault was repelled, a wildcat sank a Japanese submarine. So what uh, what was it like for the Marines between 12 and 22 December inclusive? Well, um, as you might imagine, they were ecstatic that they beat back the first attack. Uh, but once the adrenaline rush of that happened, they kind of uh, got into a daily routine of being bombed by the Japanese, about 30 planes or so uh, around noon. The Japanese were very predictable about around noon. Um, they'd be bombed by about 30 planes or so. Uh, and uh, the uh, the survivors of that uh, say that uh, it was kind of like uh, being zombies, half asleep, half awake. Uh, one day was a lot like the next, and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of concern naturally that the Japanese are going to come back. Now, what I found interesting in my research for this is that Major Devereaux moved his uh, coastal defense guns and his anti aircraft guns around the island. So the Japanese would bomb, you know, at noon that day, and in that, in you know, intervening afternoon, evening, uh, Major Devereaux would switch, his, would move his guns around. So when the Japanese bombed the second, he would bomb the next day. Uh, they're bombing, in, you know, they're bombing empty, empty space. So um, I'm going to discuss this in slide 12 at, at, in some detail, but. There was no intent by the Navy to send a rescue force to Wake Island, and we'll discuss that in detail in slide 12. Uh, the, the Marines on Wake Island were hoping that there was going to be a rescue force, but 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 there wasn't going to be a rescue force. Um, inexplicably, until the eve of the second Japanese attempt to take Wake Island, Pearl Harbor had a very uh, rosy picture of the situation on the island. And I don't know why that is because C Commander Cunningham, the CEO of the Naval Air Station there was sending messages back to Pearl Harbor every every day uh, stating what was going on. And I don't know how those could have been interpreted as you know anything but pretty grim, but they, but they were interpreted as very, uh, very uh, rosy, very positive. Not only changed when uh, uh, PBY Catalina was sent to Wake Island on a 21 uh, on 20 December, and um, uh, the ensign there flying it, ensign Murphy, uh, disembarks from 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 his plane, and he's he's in starch khakis and he's literally carrying a little overnight bag, and he wants to know where the uh, Pan Am Hotel is, which you know is a smoking wreck, and. Uh, after he he was there overnight and he saw how bad it was, he saw how bad it was. He flies back to Pearl Harbor on the twenty first with uh, key personnel that have been evacuated, and uh, uh, he gives his report to Pearl Harbor. And finally, you know, finally Pearl Harbor understands how desperate the situation is. Okay, so on twenty three December nineteen forty one, the Japanese try again. Uh, this time, instead of uh, a few old light cruisers and some destroyers. They come back with two aircraft carriers, two of the aircraft carriers that attack Pearl Harbor. They have 115 planes on them collectively in their two air groups. They come back with heavy cruisers, which have a, uh, have a their eight inch guns have a range of uh, 31,500 miles, uh, which well outranges the 14,000 or uh, 31,500 yards which well outranges the 14,500 yards of Devereaux's five inch guns. And this time the Japanese stay out of gun range and they're kind of circling. And, and, and this is starting about, you know, a little after midnight, the Japanese are circling the island. They put some ships uh, north of Peel Island and bombard it to make it uh, appear that they're going to land there. Um, so Devereaux and his Marines weren't really sure where the Japanese were going to land. Uh, but what they did do, uh, as you can look at the graphic there, this time they took uh, 2,500 by Special Naval Landing Force troops. 
and they landed uh, in four major places, uh, one on Wilk Island and three places on uh, Wake Island. Uh, patrol boat 31 or 32, 33, those were old destroyers that they ran aground on Wake Island because the Japanese were, were desperate to uh, erase the shame, the loss of face for not taking Wake Island the first time. And this time they weren't taking any chances. So they brought the aircraft carriers and they brought the heavy cruisers and they brought in uh, about five times as many troops, troops to do that. And here's the interesting point. About 7.30 or so, Commander uh, Cunningham and Major Devereaux decide to surrender the island. And what I found very interesting about this is that there's a there's a, a Lieutenant Poindexter on Wake Island proper, and he is actually forcing the Japanese back to their landing craft, to the patrol boats on the beach when when Devereaux decides to surrender. Uh, the Captain Platt on Willis Island had wiped out the entire Japanese force, uh, except for two POWs they took. So they had secured Wilkes Island and Lieutenant Poindexter was pushing the Japanese back to the beach on Wake Island proper. And Devereaux and Commander Cunningham did not know this. All they knew is that where their two command posts were located fairly close to each other on Wake Island, that there was a hospital there and the Japanese were advancing and, and they, they thought that uh, based only on what they could see because of the phone lines had been cut, uh, that, uh, that, the, that the situation is pretty grim. And uh, that's when uh, Commander Cunningham sends the last message to Pearl Harbor, enemy on island, issue in doubt. And the problem here is that is that I, I think they surrendered too soon, in my opinion. Um, when Major Devereaux came to Lieutenant Poindexter on Wake Island, uh, Lieutenant Poindexter thought he was coming to congratulate him for forcing the Japanese back. And he was quite a shock to find out he was actually being told to surrender. When uh, Devereaux got to Wilkes Island and told uh, Captain Platt uh, that he was to surrender, he was. You know, that, that, was, that, that was a huge shock to him, too, because he had beat the Japanese. So did um, did the uh, did 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 Commander Cunningham and Major Devereaux uh, surrender too soon? I think they did. Uh, they surrendered based on only what they could see uh, in their immediate vicinity. And they didn't realize that the Japanese were losing the battle, losing the battle, had lost the battle on Wilkes Island, was losing the battle on Wake Island proper. Um, and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's two versions of events, uh, as to who decided to surrender, uh, Commander Cunningham claims that Major Devereaux as a ground forces commander came to him and said, Hey, my Marines, you know, have had it. We, we, we have to surrender, uh, Major Devereaux's version of events, as you might expect is the opposite. The commander Cunningham came to him and wanted to surrender and didn't want to fight anymore. Regardless, uh, the Marines surrendered, and uh, by 0950, the J J Japanese have taken control of Wake Island. One point I do want to make is that while I do think that the, more than likely the Japanese would have had their second landing attempt defeated, um, eventually Wake Island was going to fall. No matter what happened, Wake Island was eventually, eventually going to fall. Uh, so post-battle aftermath. Uh, the Marines uh, pretty quickly go right into captivity in China. And as is well known, um, the uh, POW uh, uh, rate of surviving Japanese captivity was pretty low. But interestingly enough, the Wake Island Marines survived at about a 96% rate, which was just one percentage point below the 97% rate that the Allied prisoners survived in German POW camps in Europe. And why was that? Well, because Major Devereaux did something very interesting. He wanted to keep the sense of unit and the unit cohesion of his Marines. 
it was Wake Island Marines. And he spent really the rest of the war uh, working towards that. And because of that sense of unit cohesion and that sense of uh, depending on each other, uh, the Wake Island Marines actually got through their captivity in relatively, in relatively good shape. Um, so I just find that interesting. Uh, what, 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 you know, this commanding officer did for his Marines uh, uh, when, when they were in captivity made the difference for a lot of them uh, to be able to come home. Uh, most of the 1146 contractors were sent to China in groups of a couple hundred at a time, China or Japan. But eventually, um, and eventually only about 100 contractors are left. And then uh, what happens is, is uh, on 6 October 1943, uh, six aircraft carriers, our Navy's aircraft carriers, attack Wake Island in a, in a, um, in a uh, one of the very first carrier attacks uh, with the new SS class and independence class light carriers. The, the first one was, was in August in Marcus Island, and this is the second one. And it's uh, really uh, uh, the uh, exercise in the new F-6, F Hellcat, the new airplanes, the new carriers, and they bomb Wake Island. And uh, it's pretty successful. They don't lose very many people. Um, and they got some real world combat experience. But unfortunately, the uh, Japanese Rear Admiral in command of Wake Island, for whatever reason, decided to execute the 98 remaining contractors after the raid, which, which he did. Okay, did the Navy abandon the Wake Island Marines? Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, I think that uh, in the Marine Corps and the psyche of the Marine Corps, that uh, there is a perception that the Navy abandoned the Marine Corps on Wake Island, and then the Navy turned around and did it at Guadalcanal too. Um, I won't keep every, everyone in suspense. The Navy did not abandon the Marines on Wake Island, and I'll explain why. First of all, the Navy never envisioned fighting a fleet action for Wake Island. They never envisioned fighting the Japanese Navy for Wake Island. Uh, you can see the map earlier in the presentation. I mean, it's way out there in the middle of the Pacific. Um, it's, it's going to fall eventually, no matter what happens. Um, the Navy did envision possibly sending reinforcements, even maybe evacuating the garrison, but never to actually fight the fleet action. So what happened was Admiral Husband Kimmel, Commander in Chief Pacific Fleet at the time of Pearl Harbor, um, was, was a big proponent to reinforce Wake Island. Notice I said reinforce, not relieve. Reinforce Wake Island. And um, he set that in motion right after the Pearl Harbor attack. But it took a long time to get that uh, relief force, that reinforcement group headed towards Wake Island. And there were there were myriad uh, reasons for this. One reason is that the fuel estimates that the Navy used pre-war were completely and utterly uh, unrealistic. So the Navy uh, found out that they used twice as much fuel as peacetime would indicate. Now, why was that? Because in peacetime, the Navy put an emphasis on uh, gas mileage, in essence, of not using fuel. And one of the battle ease you could get on it for a ship was engineering efficiency. And if you use less fuel than the other, say the other battleships, you were rewarded for that. And we've all heard of Admiral Hyman Rickover. He was an engineer officer on a battleship and two years in a row and won the battle E for engineering efficiency and the way he did it was he made sure that the uh he, he wouldn't let the sailors have uh hot showers he went around and screwing light bulbs in the ship uh and and so that's a that's really unrealistic uh view of fuel efficiency and what one of the things they found out was that when you're when you're steaming the navy used a use a yardstick of uh, moving at 15 knots. 
15 knots being a, a sustained speed. The problem is, is even if you're moving a task force of ships at 15 knots, the ships have to keep their boilers lit and their engines ready to respond to, you know, 25 or 30 knots. And that takes uh, fuel, that takes more, you're using more fuel to do that. I mentioned that because uh, from the Marine Corps perspective, Admiral uh, uh, Black Jack Fletcher, who was the Admiral in command of the Saratoga Task Force that was sent to cover the Wake Island uh, relief expedition in the uh, seaplane Tangier, uh, is accused of being too worried about his fuel supply. Uh, in reality, uh, he had a legitimate reason to uh, refuel. Uh, refuel his, his ships. And another part of the problem was that there was a lack of oilers at Pearl Harbor. So you have the attack at, on Pearl Harbor and our Navy was, was in a state of shock and that's not an exaggeration at Pearl Harbor. That's not an exaggeration. Um, they were terrified of another Japanese carrier attack on Pearl Harbor. So what they would do is they take the three Pacific Fleet carriers, the Saratoga, the Lexington, and the Enterprise. They rush them into Pearl Harbor overnight, refuel them as much as they could, reprovision them, and then rush them out uh, before the sun came up the next morning because they were worried about the Japanese attacking. And they kept the carriers at sea uh, for the purpose of not being at Pearl Harbor so they can't be attacked, and also so that um, they can protect Pearl Harbor. So you need, you need, uh, and then what they did was to, when they decided to uh, send some uh, relief, a relief expedition to Wake Island, what they did was they, they took their three carrier task forces and they took the Lexington and Enterprise task forces and they sent them to the, the south of the Marshall Islands where the Japanese are launching their, you know, land-based bomber attacks. And they were attacking, attacking them from the south to, uh, to hopefully draw the Japanese attention away from the north with the Saratoga escorting, excuse me, with the Saratoga escorting the Tangier with some Marines and the radar, et cetera, headed to Wake Island. Um, and that right there proves that the, uh, shows that the Navy never meant to fight for Wake Island. Uh, they only meant to uh, send in the Tangier, uh, maybe even uh, uh, the captain of it, who later became uh, uh, an admiral. He, he literally thought uh, he, he might just, uh, uh, Captain Sprague, he, he thought he might literally just run it aground on Wake Island uh, so that it uh, you could get the supplies off. If, the, if our Navy was seriously thinking of fighting for Wake Island, they would have put all three carrier task forces together and sent them to Wake Island. But because they sent them uh, in different directions, uh, that that shows that they, they, they were just trying to get that ship Tangier there. And there were there was a lot of um, there were a lot of uh, delays in getting that ship underway. Uh, one thing that happened was the Saratoga was coming into Pearl Harbor, someone made a mistake, put seawater in one of their fuel bunkers, fuel tanks, and and the Saratoga literally ran out of fuel as it was pulling up to its pier. And, uh, you know, they had to deal with that. Um, there was a, just, just, a, just a, a massive amount of confusion. Um, the captain of Tangier, Captain Sprague, wasn't even told about this at first, um, so he could uh, get get the equipment for the seaplanes off and get the Marines and equipment on. And uh, the reinforcement convoy to wake was the idea of, like I said, Admiral Kimmel, sink pack on 7 December. Um, he was relieved because of Pearl Harbor while the convoy was en route to, rake, to wake. Um, the acting sink pack, uh, Vice Admiral Pai, was against sending the convoy and wanted to cancel it immediately, but a couple of members of his staff, including a Marine Colonel, um, advocated very strongly for this to, to go forward. 
So he, he let it go forward, and then he almost canceled it after hearing uh, Ensign Murphy's report, the PBY pilot, about how grim things were. But as soon as he heard Cunningham's dispatch to Pearl Harbor enemy on island, issue in doubt, he, 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 can, he canceled the Wake Island um, reinforcement convoy. Um, the Marines on Wake Island, I know then and now Marines have felt that the Navy abandoned them, but the reality was you don't want one aircraft carrier to go up against two Japanese aircraft carriers. And, and our Navy was never going to um, risk aircraft carriers to try to fight for Wake Island as it was. Um, the relief, ex the, the reinforcement convoy uh, probably would have got to Wake Island and would have been helpful to reinforce the defenses if it had got there before the Japanese attacked. But there was just day after day, there was just massive confusion um, and uh, uh, a lot of problems that you would expect when you when you go to war at, at the beginning of a war. And that's why the, uh, the the reinforcements were not were not dispatched in a timely manner. Uh, because this is the same Admiral, Vice Admiral Frank Fletcher who was a carrier commander uh, when he was a rear admiral at Wake Island. Now he's a vice admiral at Guadalcanal. I'm going to just touch on this uh, very, very simply. Uh, you can read the slide there, but very, very simply, it, it boils down to this. The the uh, the 1st Marine Division, Vandergrift, the amphibious force commander, rear admiral Richard Kelly Turner, post-war claimed that uh, Fletcher left them in the lurch by withdrawing his carriers two days after the landing. So 7 August, the 1st Marine Division reinforced, lands on Guadalcanal, and then on August 8th, his carriers hightail it out of the area. Here's a problem. Uh, Turner said he only needed two days to unload his ships, and he found out that uh, he needed five days to unload his ships, and he rewrote history and, and rewrote history and, and said he originally said five when he said two days the other problem was if uh if you keep carriers tied down in one geographical area they have a tendency to get sunk by japanese submarines and you can ask the uss wasp later on in 1942 or the uss Lisbon bay in october 1943 off of macon island or november 1943 off of macon island um about that and his, he lost 20% of his fighter strength. And uh, at that time, the Navy did not, and their carrier groups did not have a lot of fighters. They were heavy on attack, torpedo planes and dive bombers, because they felt that the best carrier uh, construct was to sink the Japanese carriers first. Um, but they they found out that they needed, needed more fighters. So uh, Fletcher left. Um, he would have stayed a third day if Turner had bothered to tell him he needed a third day to help unload the um, transports. And uh, but but he had to conserve his carriers because he knows there's a major battle coming up, which could decide whether we hold on to Wake Island. And that happened the Battle of Issa Solomon's on 20, uh, 24, 25 August. So uh, even though Vandergrift and his Marines were not abandoned by the Navy. Uh, they, they felt they were, which is understandable. And, and that seems to be something that's kind of in the Marine Corps psyche. I read once a couple of years ago that, that uh, the reason the Marine Corps has Harriers is because of Guadalcanal. We never want to be in a Guadalcanal situation. And that's not actually true why we have Harriers. Um, it's not quite that straight line, but it, it does tell you that this is something that, that sticks in the minds of some Marines. Well, uh, some lessons learned here for Wake Island. Um, at the very, very beginning of war, there will be mass confusion. If we go, if and when we go to war against China, there's going to be mass confusion uh, from the top of the chain of command to the bottom of the chain of command, and that's just that's just normal. Uh, peacetime assumptions will not be realistic. Whether it's fuel estimates or how much ammunition you use, or uh, or what have you, there's just gonna be a lot of peacetime assumptions that will not be realistic. You're gonna have the people are gonna to have to learn the hard way of what does and does not work. Uh, frankly, uh, for the uh, you know the EABO concept, there just may not be enough Navy to go around 
to uh, protect uh, an advanced base or to reinforce an advanced base. And some of these advanced bases might, um, might um, uh, fall just because we don't have enough Navy in the Western Pacific to fight for all of them, to protect all of them. Um, the first shock of combat uh, for a lot of people is going to be, uh, or the first time in combat is going to be a shock to a lot of people, even if they're sensibly ready. And the last thing I'd like to mention is the uh, Commandant seems to be wanting to divest the Marine Corps of legacy weapons and buying weapons that have not been proven that are supposed to do certain things. And you'll notice that it was legacy weapons that sank the two destroyers. It was a legacy weapon that sank the Japanese submarine. It was a legacy weapon that heavily damaged a light cruiser. And it was a legacy weapon, um, legacy weapons that repelled the, the, you know, the first assault. So, um, Ian, that's all I had. Um, I'm happy to take, you know, any questions people have. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much, Skip. Uh, I'm just going to pull the slides down here so we can all see each other. Um, yeah, no, that was good. And I, I, you know, I've already seen the slides, obviously, before this, but I was, I'm glad to, I'm, I'm always happy to help sort of reemphasize the, you know, those, those vampire myths, right? Like, you know, we were abandoned here and there when it's, it's simply not borne out, but it still persists. And I'll, uh, if the, to the audience, um, I'd highly recommend kind of a, a quick shot that shows how that was not the case, at least at Guadalcanal, is James Hornfisher's Neptune's Inferno, where, uh, you know, the Iron Bottom Sound off Guadalcanal was called Iron Bottom Sound for a reason, because those were a lot of Navy ships down there, you know, struggling um, up and down the slot in what was probably, at least in, we've, I think we've talked about this, probably the last time we were in a truly contested peer naval fight where it wasn't really clear who was going to gain the advantage um yeah the navy the navy was there no doubt anyway um we got a bunch of questions coming in the chat here so i want to make sure uh, we, we get to all those with the time we have so first um a couple from blake wilson asking um uh if those civilians on Gu uh, sorry those civilians on wake island did they participate in the defense at all and then uh who were those key personnel that the navy sent a pby to try and evacuate in the middle of the battle yeah, those are good questions. Uh, so you had 1,146 contractors on the on the island. Um, if I remember correctly, about 300 of them offered their services to Major Devereaux and the others hid in the bushes. Um, so about 300 of them fought and the others hid in the bushes. And then the key personnel, um, one of the uh, the key personnel was, was a uh, Army Air Forces major who was a radar expert. They did not want him to fall into Japanese hands. And as uh, some of you uh, know, um, on the, the morning of Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese strike force was coming in, 188 planes from the north, there were some B-17s coming in from the east. And the duty officer thought that what was showing up on the radar in, in northern Oahu was, was the, the, the B-17s. The reason I mentioned that is that uh, radar officer and his contingent of Army Air Force personnel were there on Wake Island to to facilitate the B-17s uh, that were being sent to the Philippines. So you had you had that guy, and then you had some uh, uh, some uh, 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 Pan Am civilians that were evacuated. I, and I think yeah, you had some Pan Am civilians. So one radar expert in the Pan Am civilians. All right, great, thank you. All right, next question is from Nathaniel Stuss. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and he has, he's actually calling back to an earlier broadcast we did at the beginning of this year with the late Art Corbett, who um, in his presentation talked about the quote, uh, a ship is a fool to fight a fort. So, you know, they're looking at this where you did have a ship fighting a fortified position and, uh, and what happened to it. How would you rate the technology balance between offense and defense in this case study and what might some of your personal thoughts be to how we could apply this to, you know, our EABO and force design ideas today? Well, first of all, I am familiar with the, uh, the Corbett um, quotation, and I believe the context of that is he was talking about wooden ships against, you know, masonry forts. And um, 
it did seem like uh, in the late 18th night, early late 18th and early 19th century, like during the Napoleonic Wars, it did seem that the that the force had the advantage. Um, uh, on, in the case of Wake Island, the offense had the advantage. You'll notice that in in one of the slides, I had a, a painting of the coast five inch coast defense guns. They're 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 a little bit dug in, but that's what they look like. They were not in uh, a bunker uh, or some sort of turret. They were just kind of out in the open, and their maximum range was fourteen thousand five hundred yards. Uh, the Japanese heavy cruisers with their eight inch guns were thirty one thousand five hundred yards. So the Japanese had the advantage of, in my opinion, uh, the offense trumping the defense. The reason why the first attack appears to be different is because the Japanese were very, very, um, were very, very uh, overconfident and came in close and kept coming in closer. Uh, I, I hope hope that hope that answers hope that answers the question. As far as as far as today, um, I think we're not going to really get it have a definitive answer on that until until this this happens. Um, I'm inclined to think that um, that uh, a navy on the move is by better than people just sitting on an island. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but that's that's really the only. The only insight I have about about the contemporary today. All right, thank you. So, next question from Nayla Mengel asking, uh, and uh, I'm I'm gonna actually add my own, a little addendum to this um, of my own, just to be clear. But the the main question is from her. So, asking uh, first off, is what Major Major Devereaux did during that first attack on Wake Island in terms of you know holding until they were very close and then opening up? Does that compare to what uh, Kurbayashi did during the Battle of Iwo Jima in terms of their their uh, tactical approach to repelling the, the Marines. And then my additional thought on that is, um, was there any conscious uh, adoption of that on the Japanese side actually to to mirror Wake Island at all, or was that was that just a coincidence? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, um, I just uh, sent a book review to the Gazette this morning, and. Um, uh, as writing the book review, I actually went back and and uh, looked at a book um, about a, a biography of Marine General, and they were talking about what what that guy did on Iwo Jima, and uh, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but what what Devereaux was doing was analogous to the Battle of Bunker Hill, where where they said you know don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. What the Japanese did for the first part of the Pacific War, Tarawa and um, uh, Rio, Rio Namar and Kwajalein and the Marianas, Guam, Saipan, Saipan, Saipan and Tinian is that they would fight us at the water's edge and try to push us back in the water. And they almost did that in Tarawa if they were ever going to do it, that's when they would have been able to do it. So they'd fight us at the water's edge and then that night launch a Bunzai attack, hoping to think, you know, hoping that you, you know, destroy the Marine perimeter, force it back in the water's edge. And then at the Battle of Peleliu in 1944, which is an island we should not have taken, west of the Philippines, um, the colonel in command of that said, hey, we're, we're going to try something different. We're just going to try to bleed these guys. We're going to let them land on the island and we're just going to you know, bleed them to death. And that's that's what the guy did on Iwo Jima and the, and the Japanese general Okinawa in the southern part of Okinawa. Um, he knew that he could not stop the landing. And the reason they couldn't stop the landing more than any other reason was the naval gunfire support. So he never, the, the Japanese commander of Iwo Jima never envisioned pushing uh, the, uh, the uh, Fifth Amphibious Corps back into the sea. He always knew that they would land, that they would establish a beachhead, and he was going to, uh, he knew the island would fall, 
He was going to take as many Marines and sailors as he could with him. And you know, he was very successful because in all the battles in the Pacific, Iwo Jima is the only battle where we, the Americans, suffered more casualties than the Japanese. So he had about 20, 22,000 Japanese on the island. Uh, we killed most of them, obviously, but the Marine Corps suffered 26,000 casualties. Um, and then uh, what was the second part of the question? Oh, about Wake Island. No, I don't think the Japanese took a look, a look at Wake Island uh, as, as a, a lesson. The Japanese were always very offensive minded, sometimes to their detriment. Uh, for example, they would uh, they did not think that uh, anti-submarine warfare was important, so they would not escort their convoys adequately in our submarines. Once the torpedo, <laughs> torpedo situation got fixed, we're sinking their Marus left and right. Um, and it was very, very hard for these guys uh, on Peleliu and Iwo Jima and Okinawa. It was very hard sometimes for these guys to convince their subordinates to fight, to fight in a way that would bleed us to death instead of the the glorious bonsai charge and try to push us back into the sea. And uh, I hope I answered your questions. That they're good questions. I hope I answered your questions. Yeah, I think you did. Um, thank you. And actually, that takes us. We're a little over an hour here, and. That was the last question I had in the chat. So um, I think that's a perfect time to uh, to hit stop and uh, uh, cut everyone out to the weekend. So Skip, thanks very much for uh, for coming on and flexing with their flexing with our schedule to get you on here. And everyone in the audience, thanks for joining us today. Um, we'll be uh, on hiatus for another couple of weeks since we got a, another holiday coming up here in uh, just next week. Happy birthday to all the Marines out there and happy Veterans Day to everybody else. Uh, but make sure you're following us on our social media channels and staying tuned because we do have some more brewcasts here in the works and we hope you join us all for those thank you education is what's important training preparation for the expected education preparation for the unexpected